Good morning and welcome to our today's Let's Talk Science session. The two scientists um, will have a look at hybrid manufacturing uh, today that should save 50% time and 80% material. So we are interested to know more about it. Uh, especially they will look at additive manufacturing technologies, which uh, we all know that have gained a momentum in the last years, um, here especially the DI, D, DED technology, direct energy deposit, or the second is wire arc additive manufacturing uh, technology. And um, we all know, meanwhile, by a lot of demonstrations at shows and uh, other sessions, the potentials of uh, additive uh, technologies, um, but Nevertheless, it still uh, needs trial and error to set up a stable process. Um, and this, especially when there is uh, multi-material uh, processes that are, are going to be used. Uh, and that's, I think, the major topic of today's session. Um, the two speakers will show us methods that uh, not only save time, but also mentioned in the title, would save um, material depending on the specific component ge geometry. The results that are presented are part of an ongoing research project called ADPROC ad 2 uh, driven by the Technical University Vienna and the KU Leuven, the Catholic University Leuven, and uh, the two speakers um, that will present the um, um, the content today, um, Mr. Gernot Mautner, who is research assistant at the Technical University in Wien, in the, Un in the Institute for Production Engineering and Photonic Technology, and he is focusing on CAD, CAM solutions for hybrid processes. And the second is uh, Mr. Syed Aref Banai. Uh, he has graduated in welding engineering at KU Leuven, and since 2022, he is also an academic research assistant uh, and staff at KU Leuven in the field of sustainable materials management. So we are uh, keen to hear uh, about these results, and I hand over to the two speakers. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Yeah, a nice welcome uh, to everyone who is listening in, EMO, let's talk science, let's talk a little bit about hybrid manufacturing methods to optimize our traditional conventional part manufacturing. Um, we split the presentation today between Carl Leuven and the TU Wien uh, for, for several reasons. One was we wanted to give you a little use case, uh, kind of already in preparation for what will be shown from various um, companies and, and research institutes at the EMO show uh, this year. Uh, and the second topic is then a little bit more research uh, where we can definitely highlight how much work there's still left uh, when we really want to go down that road and really want to uh, implement additive technologies as a uh, soon conventional part of machining. We have already been introduced. My name is Gernot Mautner from TU Wien. Uh, my colleague Sayed Arif Banaye from KU Leuven. Uh, we together uh, designed the presentation and are your speakers today. Um, and especially talking about additive manufacturing, we don't think that uh, that needs a lot of introduction. Uh, I think in the last years, uh, we all know how additive technology is ramped up in the markets. Various providers are in the market by now. And there are several different technologies uh, to look at actually for various applications. Uh, for this presentation, already in advance, a little note, we focus a little bit more on the topics of DAD and wire arc additive manufacturing. Uh, so we are not talking a lot about uh, powder processing um, for various reasons. You will see that in the presentation. But in general, uh, a lot of what we do here is not only for Relativity Space and NASA and, and a lot of big companies uh, and institutes. Uh, there are a lot of advantages also for smaller companies and for a wider industry using additive manufacturing, such as uh, typical ones near net shape manufacturing instead of uh, manufacturing from a big piece of material. Uh, you have new opportunities to combine material in specific regions. Uh, you have the opportunity to use special coatings 
uh, when it comes to specific areas of your part that needs uh, special functions. Um, or uh, an important topic, especially obviously these days, sustainable production, energy efficient production, uh, repair processes gain a lot of uh, movement. So we try to use parts, components, uh, via repair services as long as we can in the value chain before we actually go back to the original road uh, and, and start the full recycling processes of such a material. Yeah? Um, very often uh, parts are 80%, 90% working, but just a few features are worn off or are, are broken off and additive technologies can help here that uh, a quick, fast repair service is keeping those materials in the loop. And these things uh, we are researching currently in a project called Adproc Ad Project, Advanced Processing of Additively Manufactured Parts. We actually a consortium uh, of, of several research institutes. Uh, in Austria, we have the, the FOTEC and the TUV and IFT. Germany, we have the colleagues from uh, Schmackhalden uh, Machining Institute, from Stuttgart, as well as from uh, Dortmund. And also Belgian is joining in in the program with the Karl Löwen and the Thomas Moore the, uh, University of Applied Sciences. Uh, all of the uh, funding and processes going on comes from the Cornet Collaborative Research Network and is handled then by uh, various clusters and funding agencies such as the, the FKM, the EcoPlus, uh, Niederösterreich, uh, and FFG, etc. Or, or everybody who was participating or who is participating uh, is here uh, important to be known. Adbrock at two, we had already a first project, the numbers indicating that, uh, quite successful, focusing a lot on, on powder bed processes. Uh, the Karl Löwen and Theo Wien are now moving, as I already mentioned, more towards Wirearc additive machining processes and uh, looking into the manufacturing using those uh, uh, technologies. And especially here, I would like to uh, show you a little use case uh, that we did in our laboratories and from where I also derived the, the title of the presentation. Um, it's called hybrid manufacturing. Hybrid in, in that case means uh, we combine additive technologies with subtractive technologies, which is one focus point in the Cornet research project at Brogat2. So we look into can those hybrid process chains have advantages when it comes to saving material, saving energy, saving process time, uh, saving cost. All of that is, is a factor in there that we uh, look into with some uh, industrial partners that are also part of the research project. And just to give you a little insight, what are we talking about? Hybrid process chains, um, there are different versions. Uh, you see here one cell that was designed by Theo Wien and is uh, uh, durable in the facilities here in Vienna. You can see on the right a robotic welding cell uh, from the company IGM, an Austrian company. And you have on the left side uh, a machining center from the company Emco in that case. And in between you have a, a robot who is manipulating the parts. Uh. So with such a cell setup and with the required cell controller and so on and the programs, we have the opportunity in general to run actually an automated process from a welding robot where the part buildup is uh, happening to the machining center where you create actual the, the surface that you need then for your application. And obviously you can uh, integrate, thanks to Industry 4.0 uh, years, a lot of sensory tools in there. Uh, you can actually measure quite a lot what's going on in the process. Um, also interesting on the milling side, but especially for additive processes where still so much is unknown, we use a lot of sensors still to understand what's happening uh, for specific geometries and specific materials, and Arif will show you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. That's the use case that I want to uh, quickly uh, go over with you, uh, and it's actually a very nice one because it was at our university uh, done by two students. One student was actually resp responsible for the design of this speedboat propeller, and the picture on the top right is actually the student in a, uh, such a speedboat in the US. It's, it's quite a hobby of him. And he designed uh, an, an, a propeller that he uh, needed for, for the races. And uh, yeah, we had only conventional manufacturing technologies available. And then we said, why not trying something new? Why not trying uh, for such a geometry, uh, maybe uh, an additive and subtractive process combined, uh, creating a hybrid machining process. And with that, we went into the machining cell and try to make it happen. 
And you can see here a few uh, insights uh, from the programming side. Uh, we used uh, Siemens NX CAD CAM systems uh, for both machining centers, including post processors, etc. Uh, you need definitely a strong CAD CAM system when you create uh, those complex geometries. So uh, interesting topic also in our research project that we get actually the different manufacturers of robot welding cells also uh, in that road that uh, traditional CAM systems are, are used when programming those, those movements. Yeah. And you can also see here in the middle that additive technologies is not only interesting on the part, but it's also interesting uh, when it comes to the setup, yeah, where we use typical cylinders and then kind of edit some features to mount the fixture on the plate of the machining table. So as you all know, a lot of creativity is needed and, and, and is wished when you talk about and use additive technologies. In the beginning, it was mentioned trial and error. Uh, and from my point of view, that's still very, very true. Um, a lot of what research institutes are doing these days is trial and error handling of additive processes, trying to figure out what are the right uh, process parameter combinations for certain materials. And also what's the right build-up strategies. You can see here our first shots on the propeller really from a base plate. Um, we developed uh, too much uh, heat, too much energy into the process and, and the welding path was not uh, working out. Um, and we had insufficient bonding, we had a lot of holes in there, so that was not a strategy that worked. So we decided to actually create a, a, the, a basic cylinder done by a turning process and we only weld kind of then um, the, the propeller uh, plates then on the side uh, to reduce the amount of energy and heat we put into the part. That worked much better uh, and I'm sure uh, you know some other uh, geometries and use cases in that direction. That's uh, actually looking now very easy when you look at the videos. Still there is a lot of work going into the trial and error phase. Still there's a lot of work going into thinking about the fixture, about the process. Um, and a lot of unexpected things are happening when you use such a hybrid process. So um, we're very happy that it worked in that specific use case. And I would actually like to highlight the results before I hand over to my colleague, which I think are more interesting for you uh, at that stage, because that's quite significant. The material waste that we have compared to a conventional machining process where we would machine the, the part out of a full cylinder are obviously significant. Yeah? Um, removing all the material out of the cylinder is, is a lot of waste. Um, sometimes you can use the burrs and recycle them, reuse them, etc. But still when we talk about uh, recycling processes, you, you don't want to do that anymore in the future. You don't want to create a lot of waste that you then need to recycle in, in early process stages. All of that is effort, uses energy. Um, better is you don't have that waste in the first place, right? So a near net chip geometry is helping actually a lot. But it was also quite surprising, also when you combine the machining times. Uh, so a conventional machining on one machine, um, only the, the cylinder is, is done on the turning center compared to a hybrid process was also uh, half of the machining time uh, and, and providing uh, therefore a lot of saving potentials as well. So it's not only that the chips can be reused, it's also that the machining of those chips uh, in, in the conventional case just take a lot of time and create a lot of toolware and all of that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. So when we're asking the question or uh, adding uh, uh, something to our title for the presentation, we try to uh, uh, give you a strong statement. We try to motivate you looking into those technologies, look into use cases, rethink your current portfolio uh, with uh, additive technologies, various ones, uh, and you know, just really get creative when it comes to creating new options for your manufacturing chains. There is a lot to do, 50% um, savings was good, but uh, there is still plenty of work and plenty of opportunities. And one very interesting optimization example uh, in regards to multi-material processes uh, is now demonstrated by my colleague Arev, and I would like to hand over now the word to him. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Notner, for your nice presentation. Uh, now, um, I will give a specific use of wire arc additive manufacturing in terms of multi-material uh, deposition. Uh, this uh, presentation would be a bit more in uh, technical, but uh, I'll try to keep it uh, interesting. 
Uh, in the next slide, uh, I will uh, tell you uh, about the application and the issues regarding the manufacturing of multi-material uh, parts. Uh, the applications uh, mostly are used uh, as corrosion resist, uh, corrosion protection for like uh, pipe, pipes or pressure vessels in the petrochemical industry, which there is a corrosive environment and also as a transition parts in functionally graded materials. For example, in a bimetallic part, uh, when we are moving from material A to material B, in between we will have a, a multi-material part, which uh, do the transition part in between to have a uniform uh, property changes from material A to material B. There are quite a lot of issues uh, for via an RKT manufacturing of multi-material parts. For example, when we use two different materials, there will be two different uh, properties in uh, terms of chemical and uh, physical, like uh, the uh, melting point and also the fluidity of the material. And for each material, we need to use different uh, welding or uh, deposition parameters. So uh, in this study, we tried to find a solution for the these issues, which is uh, one of them, is a common shell, uh, common consumables for two materials, and also a deposition strategy, uh, which can be used as a guideline for uh, manufacturing multi-material parts. In the next slide, uh, I will give a short explanation of the principle of the process in uh, wire arc additive manufacturing. The wire comes through a nozzle, which is connected to a power source. It gets uh, melted by the mm, power of a, an electric arc between the substrate, between the plate and the wire. And there will be a shielding gas to protect the wire and the uh, molten pools from the air. So uh, three aspects of this uh, process have a, quite a significant impact on the results. One is the shielding gas which is used and the other is the stability of the arc and also the shape of each bit uh, that you can see at the, on the bottom uh, which is the cross-section of each uh, layer in this uh, process now uh, these three aspects have been investigated for multi-material when we are depositing two different materials next to each other uh, in the next slide uh, this is the deposition setup at k11 you can see that two power sources, uh, for a new CMT power sources, uh, which are both connected to a twin torch. Uh, this torch can handle two wires, uh, as you can see on the right figure. And now we are using two different materials. And the deposition uh, mode is sequential. Uh, like, for example, uh, first material A is deposited. Uh, and the material B is uh, deactive, and then the torch moves the same path with uh, deposition of material B. Uh, in the next slide, I will uh, explain how we analyze and analyze the stability of the arc. Uh, so first, we want to find the common shielding gas for these two materials. As a test case, uh, we used stainless steel and a grip resistant steel. Uh, at the same time, in the deposition, we collected all the current and voltage data of the process uh, using a data acquisition system. And then we compared two gases in terms of the um, different graphs in uh, current and voltage. For example, the cyclogram shows, uh, if you see at the, um, the black uh, figure, you can see the difference between using gas A to gas B. For example, gas B has a more uh, uniform and also in the other uh, figures, a clear difference has been shown that uh, shielding gas can totally uh, change the arc stability. Also, another representative of the arc stability is the amount of spatter produced during the deposition. And uh, a clear distinction has been uh, is shown between uh, gas A and gas B, for example, in uh, one of the gases, by using a few percentage of uh, carbon dioxide, we could reduce this pattern quite a lot. Uh, in the second slide, uh, uh, in the next slide, uh, yes, 
Next to the arc stability, we also uh, check the bead geometry. For example, the, uh, the uniformity of the bead uh, height and width, and the variation of the dimensions, and also the cross-section of the bead uh, to check the penetration. You can see from gas A to gas B, the penetration has been increased, and uh, which can uh, guarantee a good bonding between the material and the substrate, and also the the bonding between uh, each layer. Uh, this is both for the arc stability and the uh, shielding gas um, selection for two materials. In the next slide, I will uh, explain about the depo deposition strategy. Yeah, uh, to add one more thing, this result has been uh, validated on a multi-layer component, which are the bimetallic walls. As you can see, using a proper gas, we could uh, we could have a defectless walls, but the other gas uh, resulted in a lack of fusion in the interface, which is not acceptable in the additive manufacturing. And also it has decreased the flatness of the uh, wall, which, is, uh, which means lower machining allowance, and that's how we can uh, save material in the uh, multi-material deposition. Okay, uh, in the next slide, uh, this is the deposition strategy when we are going to deposit two materials. Uh, when we are depositing uh, overlapping beads, which has a common uh, area, overlap area together, the offset distance between these two beads are quite uh, important. For a single material, this has been done and uh, it's quite well known in the literature and uh, th there are some models, but uh, we try to find the optimum offset distance between uh, in multi-material between two materials when we have two materials the dimensions of these speeds are different the properties are different so we need a new model to find the optimum offset distance uh, in the next slide if i want to uh, show the significance of the this distance you can compare these two bits which have been uh, deposited with a slightly change in the offset distance. Uh, on the left, you see uh, when the second bit is deposited next to the first bit, uh, the bit, uh, the molten uh, pool has been spread to the other side and there is a large gap between uh, bit A and bit 2. And this gap will, will remain in the further layers and will, uh, will result in a lack of fusion. But in a, with a slightly uh, change in the uh, offset distance between these two bits, we can uh, we can have a material flow from bit two to bit A to have a complete fusion. And this model, uh, we try to find the proper offset distance, as we call it, critical offset distance, to have a optimum surface on top and also a complete fusion between materials. Uh, in the next slide, this uh, offset distance has been compared to the other models. Uh, you can see when it's uh, two different materials, if you use the previous models, uh, which are valid for the single material uh, on, on the middle and on the left, uh, there will be a lack of fusion in between the materials and we cannot get a um, acceptable component but uh, on the right using the new model we are successful to uh, have a effect free hall and in the last slide i will show some uh, test cases uh, on the on the left there are three valves to show the uh, repeatability of this model that all three has been deposited effectlessly and also another structure which we call it as a matrix or a chest structure, has been deposited using the same model by depositing material A, material B, and so on in, the, in each layer. Uh, this can prove that this model is uh, valid to have a, like a design guideline when we are going to deposit uh, multi-materials. Uh, that was my last slide. I thank you for your attention. and. If there is any question, you're welcome to ask.
Dr. Schaeffer. Yes, I uh, just switch on my mic. Um, so yes, thank you for this very interesting presentation uh, as far as I can judge it um, from a technical perspective. Um, very interesting uh, and it shows also the uh, the requirements that you take have to take into account when going into these kinds of additive processes. Um, so um, my first question uh, I receive here is what, um, because you were mentioning that it is less time and uh, less scrap or less material used, um, but could you give a statement on the cost perspective? perspective of uh, this uh, processes uh, in single material or multi-material because um, this is always or still is always a question uh, that uh, classical production methods uh, cutting or whatever um, maybe if you have larger parts uh, if you have a larger number of parts uh, maybe um, um, cheaper than uh, the production per piece, cheaper than in edited. Maybe I can answer that uh, or try to answer that. Very interesting question. Um, actually, I cannot give you from from our machining cell uh, that kind of analysis we're running currently. Uh, currently, the new use case with another uh, uh, with a company. So that would be then. A similar use case but for a real part and there we uh, will for the first time really take uh, into consideration uh, also the machining costs the depreciations and so on uh, and then we will actually have a very fair comparison because there are also serial costs existing today given on a certain lot size as, as you mentioned mm -hmm. um, another thing that we uh, want to look into is also uh, uh, the energy demand uh, so from an energy usage standpoint, how, how are those two process chains comparing? So that's another uh, interesting uh, aspect that these days uh, need to be looked into. For an industrial company, I would also say it, it depends a little bit. Um, you can buy brand new equipment, uh, hybrid machines that have you know both functions available. Um, you know that that is obviously one one side of an investment. Um, if you imagine that most companies probably have already maybe some milling machines uh, and maybe even have some uh, even older robots that they use uh, for certain applications, um, upgrading them to welding robots and then use them from time to time uh, is giving you actually uh, maybe a nice uh, you know cost sensitive uh, uh, process chain and machining chain that is not automatically going into uh, uh, too much money for the investment and you cannot show the, the advantages anymore. Okay, thank you. Um, um, well, I, what, what, what is your perspective? Is it uh, more um, feasible that in, uh, let's say, repair topics or in, uh, as you mentioned, with the propeller, more complex um, uh, five-axis machining components, um, single parts or small batches, that this is a more valid perspective for these kind of technologies? Um, I, I believe there will be different niche uh, markets for, for those kind of technologies. Um, as, as repair was mentioned, that's definitely a big one. Um, there is still a lot of manual welding uh, going on in the different industries just, just for the sake of not having something else available maybe, um, especially when you talk about big products that are uh, out somewhere on the field. Um, and here, uh, you know, a cost-sensitive uh, uh, machining or, or robotic cell that has uh, some smart sensors and can help you doing the repair process automated uh, potentially. That's something there. There is a business out for that. We have partners in the project that that are doing that. So that's something that is very real um, for for new part production, so not the repair application. Um, I think that we really varies a little bit on the supply chain needs. Um, it might be that sometimes the conventional way is still maybe uh, uh, the better one to go when you have normal stable loads. Um, but then at some point you might need uh, some specialized tasks that only uh, some specialized parts that only need a few changes um, and you only need three, but it's good money uh, that you would get. And in those kind of uh, situations where delivery time is maybe more important in a certain case, that could be something uh, that you might look into. 
Um, so I think there will be various scenarios and, and I think additive technologies, especially uh, the, those two we just presented, will be just a nice addition in, in for any metal manufacturing company uh, in the future to have. Okay, thank you. Um, concerning the multi-material deposition that you have shown um, as a yeah, pretty complex uh, uh, process that uh, you have to take care of to have a good result. Um, so is it, would it always be necessary to have this gas analysis, for example, in the beginning, uh, depending on the material you use, or is there already or will there be a kind of a, a knowledge base um, of combinations, material, gas, and all these things? Uh, well, actually, we have done this experiment for a certain set of materials, as I mentioned, uh, for stainless steel and carbon resistant uh, steel, which have a, quite a lot of applications in the high temperature services and also corrosive environments. But uh, this is not the exact uh, result for this combination. Only this uh, this is the methodology that we have uh, published. But uh, in concern of other uh, pairs of materials, uh, we are actually working on on a design guideline to give a more general uh, guideline and and more uh, practical for the industry to how they can uh, select uh, the common consumables like shielding gas and also other uh, aspects like uh, the offset distance and deposition strategies. Uh, mm, and there would be uh, more easier and uh, probably not to do all this uh, data acquisition experiments beforehand. Okay, let me see. I think uh, so far, uh, finally, my private interest, uh, could you give one or two um, applications um, for this multi-material uh, additive, uh, so to have a better understanding, because uh, what you have shown on your slides was, let's say, uh, just a test uh, situation. Uh, but uh, what is a what is a part that uh, is to be produced with these multi-material uh, concepts? Uh, yes, uh, currently in uh, mostly in the chemical industries and petrochemicals then there's a corrosive environment instead of uh, making a whole piece out of a corrosive uh, resistant material like a stainless steel or nickel based alloy we can have a cheaper material for the whole body of the component and then have a, like a, a cladding on it with the mm. corrosive uh, resistant material uh, Yes, in another study, uh, part of the same project, we are uh, investigating the feasibility of cladding uh, in Connell on a low carbon steel for the same application. Thank you. So, as far as there are no additional questions, um, uh, thanks for your very interesting presentation uh, and thanks for listening. Um, of course, uh, if somebody could not attend, please uh, give them the information. It will be visible um, later on as well on the EMO website. Um, and uh, thanks for attending and all the best and have a nice day. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.